Uh, furthermore, a, a feminist gender analysis investigates the extent to which state and national identities can lead to conflict and all these are based on gender constructions. The valorization of war through its identification with a heroic kind of masculinity depends on a feminized, devalued notion of peace seen as unattainable and unrealistic. Um, and it is historically and culturally and context-bound that women's lives and values are not all the same. Okay? Because feminists very often say women suffer in every conflict. But again, we have to look through a gender and feminist analysis the specific context and location. It informs us about the gender construction of nation and also we have um, we associate the nation usually with female the mother nation mother india and the state with the male because the state is the um, power is the sovereignty and is also where decisions are taken now i'd like to turn to some examples uh, to show you know what uh, we've been uh, i've been saying Theoretically, <coughs> and also how some of these gender issues are not really very much on the international and national agendas. <coughs> Excuse me. So here I have a quote from uh, Matthews, and she says, the Bosnian Ministry of Health estimated that 30,000 women have been abused during the war, but most hide what happened to them. As Muslim women, it is hard to talk about sex and rape. So far, the doctor says she has seen eight pregnant girls from the concentration camps where they were repeatedly raped by the Serbs. Six have had abortions and two have had uh, uh, their babies. Now, here is just an example of uh, how, you know, gender analysis will bring this data to uh, our uh, public discussion. Of course, in uh, many societies, rape and especially pregnancy has, uh, uh, as in, I have experienced this with some women I talked to in Cyprus, carries a big stigmatization, okay? They are very often cast out of their communities and their children are called the devil's children. So in other words, they come to re be traumatized again. They come to be excluded from their own social um, and communal environment. Now, another example here from uh, another camp in Uganda one, over one-third of the new mothers in the camp are under 16. Some are married. In Eastern Uganda, daughters are a valuable commodity worth seven cows in normal times. Parents have a particular urgency to marry off daughters as soon as possible so that with the prize they receive, they can then marry off sons from the animals before the animals are stolen. Other girls get pregnant because they are hungry and the promise of a small present like food, a petticoat or a pair of panties is enough for them to consent to sex. This is, I think, a very sad and very uh, powerful, in a way, um, reminder of what happens to some conflict societies, but also it brings out very clearly the, the local practices and traditions and how girls are valued or women in these societies and uh, very often how the po uh, poverty and despair you know pushes many of the girls uh, in this uh, situation um, the other thing that has come out from a gender analysis was the issue of widows very often this is a category of um, 
women, okay, who are not talked about. And uh, as, as a result of war, many women, I was um, reading um, in many uh, articles, uh, both in the press, but also uh, academic articles describing what happened to the widows in Iraq, where they're not allowed to work, they're not allowed to remarry, okay, but they are, have all these uh, practices there that make these women completely powerless. So one way to feed their children is really to resort to prostitution. And they sometimes go to areas where they are not known outside uh, and to hide from their own communities. So um, here I have another example of um, what happens uh, to in war situations where not only relationships are destroyed, but also infrastructures and uh, reinforcement also of traditions. Now, um, one thing I think that is very important to mention here is the fact that finally the international community, you know, and the European Union, um, I mean the women's NGOs and um, women's organizations have been talking a lot about uh, conflict and the gender aspect, but finally in 2000, and, um, uh, 2000 with the new millennium, the Security Council uh, voted the resolution 1325, which I think is a landmark in women's activism and struggles. And the Security Council was really pushed and very much pressured to come up with the adoption of this resolution. Now, why is it so important? Because it's the first time that the, this international body recognized the gendered nature of our war and conflict and peace building. But not only, it also came to recognize its own deficiency of ignoring the um, aspect of gender in peacekeeping and uh, in all the interventions they were making. So from now on, this resolution and the others that followed, the UN in all its missions has to train men and women in gender issues, in the culture of the countries they are sent to, and also the different roles that they can adopt in the field. So one, this is one very important uh, aspect, and in Cyprus it's the first time after since 64 that UNFISIP, the UN Peacekeeping Force, has been in Cyprus, and they've never had um, a female um, representative there. The last two years, after the, this resolution was adopted, they sent a woman who is indeed making a difference. She has a very gender sensitive lens of looking at the conflict on the ground. So it does make a difference. Now the other two issues of 1325, one of it is that in the negotiations you cannot have women being absent. Women need to sit at the negotiating table because whatever is discussed at the negotiating table does not impact or uh, affect or concern only men. It affects the whole society and women sitting there, they have a very different viewpoint. They have experienced the conflict differently. They understand issues of power, issues of security, and also issues like property, like rights, like citizenship, differently. So by being at the table, they bring a different discourse and the agenda broadens. And then the final agreement and the final writing up of the Constitution will be much more inclusive and representative of the society at large than if we had only men. So this is the second aspect that, uh, um, and um, just to mention about Cyprus, as Ahmed says, since 68 we've had uh, negotiations and no woman has ever sat at the negotiating table from both sides. 
which I will mention in a minute. So the third uh, very interesting aspect of 1325 is the aspect that peace building is a gendered process and women must have an active role in all the reconstruction processes, in all the programs that will be initiated, but also in all the um, uh, humanitarian aid, because usually when humanitarian aid comes into a post-conflict society is being uh, dealt with at the level of the state or at the level where men uh, predominate and decide uh, what to do. Um, I hear I have some ideas about why women join the military. I think I will skip this. We can discuss it in the um, uh, discussion period. Um, now, the, a few things about Cyprus. Okay. Cyprus, uh, in a nutshell, I describe it as a patriarchal, militaristic uh, political culture which becomes mediated with nationalistic uh, politics. And this is done in a very effective way because certain agendas are at the table and certain agendas are marginalized. Now, the adversarial selective master narrative has been prevalent there. The fact that the national problem has dominated uh, the um, discussion, the public discussion, has put on the margin any other issues, um, including issues of women and so on. 